My guest is Eli Pode. He's a professor at Hebrew University. Welcome to the show. Welcome. Eli, I would say, and don't be modest about this, that you're one of the foremost experts on Israeli-Arab and the, really the Arab relationship with Israel. And so I want to explore that in depth with you because it's very important to the peace process. Uh, if we went around the countries around Israel, which is most important now for the peace process? Because Egypt seems to not be the same player as it once was. Is that correct? Yeah, well, I think that Egypt is still a central player in the Arab Israeli conflict. But um, in terms of solving the conflict, I think that first of all, uh, Syria is uh, very important. Uh, there is a saying that there is no war without uh, Egypt and there is or will not be peace with the area without Syria. So Syria is a major player and therefore I think that uh, in order to get a peace, uh, a comprehensive peace, it's very important to reach out for Syria. But you are right that in order to get there, we need the help of certain players. Uh, for most, uh, the United States. And if we talk about the Arab countries, I would say two. Egypt and Saudi Arabia are very important. So you had the new initiative from the Arab League, etc. It seemed to be play a big important role and then sort of fade from the scene. Is it underground continuing to play a role? I'm not sure. This is a very important question because I've done some research on the Arab Peace Initiative and in my mind it constitutes a, a missed opportunity by Israel. I think that Israel didn't really grab the opportunity. Uh, as I see it, I think that the Arab world, in general speaking, went uh, through a very important change. And the Arab Peace Initiative uh, offers Israel a comprehensive peace with all the Arab countries for certain conditions. Uh, Israel didn't really grab when it was launched, it was in 2002. And uh, at that period there uh, was the Al-Aqsa Intifada with the Palestinian and terrorist acts. So it was very hard for the government to uh, take the initiative. But nevertheless, I mean, until 2007, it was firmly on the agenda. And it could seize, Israel could seize the opportunity and make much more than it did. Now, with the new Israeli government, the right-wing government, I don't really see any prospect in moving ahead with the Arab Peace Initiative. So in that respect, I don't see it any longer as a viable option to solve the conflict right now. Well, you described it as a missed opportunity. Do you mean that they sh should have accepted or accepted as a starting point or accepted it as a discussion point where they respond and say, oh yeah, that's okay, but we can't do Jerusalem, we can't do refugees, but we welcome. What was your appropriate response that you'd consider? Okay. Obviously, Israel could not uh, accept it as is. And I don't think it was a take it or leave it suggestions. I think that was in any bargain or any negotiations, you know, you start from a certain point. Now, you can either reject it completely, either accept it, or you can say something in the middle. I think that Israel should have adopted something in the middle of the road, saying, in principle, I agree that this is very important and we agree to a certain point, but we have certain reservation. I mean, there is the very important clause regarding the uh, Palestinian refugee issues. So many Israelis, the decision makers, I mean, uh, they seem not to accept this specific clause. So you need to rephrase it or to renegotiate it. But nevertheless, I mean, basically the initiative is a good starting point for discussion. Did the uh, Israel's not picking that up have an effect on the Arab states and particularly Saudi Arabia in sort of withdrawing or turning off Israel or turning off the possible acceptance of Israel? Yes, because I think that the Arabs trying to see it uh, from their perception, uh, they uh, took the initiative and it's quite a unique one. And it's a substantial change. I mean, I deal with the Arab world, I'm following it for many years, and I do believe that it uh, represents a substantial change on the Arab position. It doesn't reflect all the Arabs, it doesn't reflect all the Muslims, but still, nevertheless, it's important change. And therefore, when the Arabs in general, the members of the Arab League, they saw that Israel has such a reserved position, or even not really responding, I think that uh, they really uh, understood in their position that Israel is not sincere. It's not really willing. I mean, on the one hand, Israeli decision makers are 
quite often saying we are willing to negotiate, we are willing to sign peace, uh, we want recognition, whatever. Now when the Arabs came with a certain peace plan, they didn't really grab the opportunity and try to do something with that. So here arises uh, the whole question of mistrust on both sides. Let, talking about mistrust, let's go back to Syria that you originally raised because there's no peace offer from Syria, yet you, you suggested that was the most important uh, element in the whole co constellation of Arab countries. How do you break that barrier there of distrust, uh, especially since Syria seems to be playing a double game, it appears to me. Yeah. Anyway. It is playing a double game and I, and I think that uh, that is the purpose because it tries to gain the most from the whole uh, political game and uh, it succeeds quite well in that respect. Um, I think that, um, first of all, Syria is an important player. I said that already. But uh, to continue this thought, another reason why to go on the Syrian track is that there is a kind of a deadlock with the Palestinians. I know that we talk about the pro proximity talk with the Palestinians, but I mean, when you uh, essentially, when you try to evaluate the chances for moving ahead on the Palestinian-Israeli track, I don't see many chances because of the position of the current Israeli government and also the certain problems among the Palestinians, I mean between the Hamas and the Fatah, the whole conflict between them. So there are serious problems on that track. So to my mind, um, the Syrian-Israeli track is more ripe for a solution. We, we more or less know what are the parameters of a solution. What we need uh, is a brave and a charismatic leaders on both sides that are willing to take the decision. It, it's a very bold decision. So and I'm not sure that we have those leaders uh, on both sides of the conflict. But nevertheless, if theoretically you ask me which uh, track is more ripe for a solution, I would say the Syrian one. During all my time, you know, there, I think a substantial progress on that front. And unfortunately, it didn't uh, lead anywhere, but I mean, the Well, seats. let me talk about that one, because you studied with Itamar, didn't you, Itamar Rabinovich? Yes. Yeah. And he was the foremost authority on negotiating with the Syrians. Does he agree with you now, or do you have discussions, if I might say so, on this? Well, not recently, uh, but I'm not sure that he agrees with me because I'm not sure that he thinks that the Syrians are willing. Uh, I, you know, among the experts, there are differences. Right. It's not mathematics, so therefore, I can disagree even with my supervisor. You know, <laughs> it's, it's a puzzle, I know. Uh, okay, so. <laughs> Having done it myself. <laughs> so, um, um, the question of whether it's possible or not, you know, we, we can't really know unless we get them. So this is the major problem. You have to get there in order to know that. I mean, let's go backwards. During the 90s, was it impossible? I mean, Rabinovich is quite skeptical, you know, about reaching an agreement during the 90s. But I'm not sure. I mean, at the end of the 90s, during the Barack period, I mean, there was at least one opportunity that an agreement was almost signed. Yeah, it, it was, was very Bar close. Barack. Yeah, it was very close. Yeah. And it was Barack at the last moment who was very much afraid probably of the Israeli audience and the response. So to say that it was an option, um, I very much uh, uh, fear that it was another missed opportunity I at see. the end of the 90s. And there's been a lot of them as you documented. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm trying now to analyze it in a more academic way and hopefully I will come some, with some conclusion. But the bottom line is obviously that there is not only one party to be blamed for. We are talking about a conflict and in a conflict you have at least two parties and every one of them can be blamed for in that or that occasion. So. Okay, last minute, very short. How do you separate the Syrian and Iranian as Iran as the backer of Syria? Okay, my thinking about the subject is as follows. Uh, I know that uh, sometimes during um, the discussions, the, the indirect discussion maybe between the Israelis and the Syrians through the Americans, the Israeli former position is that one of the conditions is that the, Sy the Syrians have to disengage themselves from the Iranians. Now, I think that putting such a precondition is very problematic because you don't bring to the negotiations preconditions. You start without any conditions. My belief is once you conclude an agreement, supposedly conclude an agreement with the Syrians, by definition, you distance them 
from the Iranians. So because that will be the result. Because otherwise, how could you expect that they will sign an agreement at the same time will be close allies of the Iranians? I mean, that will be the result. With that, we have to end. And thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you.